Thank you, Leela. Let us pray. Loving and faithful God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you can continue to give us insight and understanding by your spirit, speaking in scripture. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as I said earlier, we're starting today a six-part series on being overwhelmed. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever feels overwhelmed. Uh, and today, um, this, this talk is, is titled, or was titled, Why Are We So Overwhelmed? And I picked this title because I thought I might actually try to answer that question. <coughs> but I was wrong um, about that. Um, the question, why are we so overwhelmed, is actually, it's not really a real question. It's, it's a cry. It's a cry. Um, I happen to be listening to a podcast this week, the Tim Ferriss podcast. I don't know if anyone knows who that is. Um, but uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, was on that podcast, and I listened to this episode. And she just had this throwaway comment in the middle of saying something else. I don't know what she was saying. And she said, why is not a spiritual question. And he actually returned to it and said, why did you say that? And she said, well, mostly because we never really receive answers when asking the big why questions. Um, and so mostly when I ask a why question to God, uh, it's, silent. it's met with silence. Um, so it doesn't actually give us a lot of answers to ask that question. But I got thinking about this after I heard her say that, and I, and I thought that it's not that the why question is not a good question to ask, it's that it's actually a cry, not a question. Like, as in, why God? Right? We're not, we're not really, I would love to have the answer, but, we're, but it's a cry into the void. Like God doesn't answer this question, at least not in the way that we seem to want. Right? So we tend to ask it thinking that if, if we can get the answer, that means we can identify the problem. And if we can identify the problem, uh, then we can solve it. Um, or the cause of the problem can be eliminated or healed, right? That's how our modern world works, right? Like, let's let's find, the, find the problem and then we'll find a solution. Uh, how well are we doing with that right now? Um, we, we actually know that that doesn't really work. Right. We just have to watch the news for, you know, half an hour, and we'll know that, that that doesn't work. Finding the problem, and now let's find the solution, doesn't, that's not actually how it is. See, we think we want the answer to be, we're so overwhelmed because, uh, I don't know, we're scrolling on our phones too much. So great. We've identified that, just stop scrolling on your phone so much. Easy. That's easy to solve. Just stop doing it. Right? Like, we think that that's what we're after. Um, I actually asked people on, uh, on my blog, uh, I could do a little survey. I sent out a survey and asked people some questions about overwhelm and got a, a pretty good response, actually. Um, so I asked people, what about life is overwhelming to you right now? And then a second question is, what kinds of things do you think are overwhelming other people right now? And so I just, I'm going to, push those answers together, and I'm just going to read you some of those, but it's a pretty long list. This is actually most of what was uh, of given, but not everything. So lots of the answers were actually deeply personal answers. So I'm not going to get into details, but lots of people answered things around personal health, health of family members, physical and mental health, both mentioned. Um, people talked about parenting at all stages, from the demands of newborns to kids learning to read, to teens and young adults navigating anxiety, and adult children <laughs> facing financial issues. Uh, people talked about caring for aging parents. Uh, generally, just family issues were mentioned a bunch. Uh, generally, financial strain, cost of living, that was overwhelming. Dealing with job loss, navigating challenging work expectations, time management, juggling numbers of responsibilities, living with deep grief. Um, and then there were things like wars, uh, the US election, 
politics in general, both in Canada mentioned and globally. COVID, still a worry, still um, things like homelessness, poverty, the asylum crisis, systemic racism was mentioned, general uncertainty about the future, the drug overdose crisis, overthinking was named as something that is overwhelming. The environment, climate change, fear of violence, bullying in schools, schools dropout rates, discrimination, children being removed from families and their culture, young people struggling to know where their future is. And there were more. And we could probably come up with 20 more, right? That's lots. I also asked people, do you have specific things you do or practices you turn to that help you when you feel overwhelmed? Um, let's also just name that even just me reading that uh, somewhat actually short list, it overwhelms us to just hear me list things off. Like, let's just name that. So, but here are some things, and people were, had all kinds of things that they do. Like, people are really creative um, that, that actually that they turn to that help them when they feel overwhelmed. Um, 29 people actually answered this survey, so it's not like, a, it's not like we did a good sample of the population, right? But it's, it's not bad, 29 people. Um, 10 people in their answers to this question use the word prayer in their answer. Um, about five people talked about reading the Bible. People reading my blog are mostly people of faith. <laughs> um, uh, nine people talked about connecting with other people is something they do. 12 people, the most responses, talked about walking, going outside, or connecting to creation in some way. Um, a handful of people talked about keeping busy, doing something on their to-do list, or making a list that actually reduced their anxiety or their overwhelm. Um, other people said that added to their overwhelm, so <laughs> it kind of depends who you are. Um, uh, about four people talked about spiritual direction, counseling, or therapy, that that's something they turned to. Um, a few people talked about sleep and rest, meditation, doing something fun, some kind of distraction like puzzles, TV, games, social media, crosswords. Some of those things also made the list of what was overwhelming to people. Um, music was mentioned, exercise was mentioned, and many people just generally mentioned God in one way or another, remembering God loves me, or that God is sovereign, or connecting with God, being outside um, to connect with God, or something like that. Um, then I ask people, uh, when you feel overwhelmed, are there specific things that you do that you know do not help you? And again, got all kinds of answers, like doom scrolling social media, consuming too much news, consuming too much food, isolating, overthinking things, not asking for help, drinking alcohol spending time with negative people, comparing myself to others, not sleeping, not drinking enough water, trying to multitask. So, I, and there were more. I don't know if this re resonates for you just hearing some of those lists, like these are the things that are overwhelming to us and these are some of the things we do. We don't always do those things. These are some other things we do and they actually make things worse and we know it. Um, overwhelm is actually everywhere. Um, most people I talk to seem overwhelmed in some way, uh, or if they're not right now, they can easily tell me a friend who is, or, you know, I'm not today, but, oh, man, yesterday. <laughs> you know, um, now hearing all of that, I want to turn to these ancient texts. We read Psalm 77, and what is interesting to me is that the ancient texts of the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, they actually speak to this sense of being overwhelmed. Like, we, ha we have a feeling that this is, like, new, um, but it's not. It's not new. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, one fun little thing to do is, like, go and pick some uh, music that you really love that is not uh, the most current music. So go and pick something from the 90s or the 80s or the 70s or the 60s and just listen to a few songs and think about how overwhelmed we are and you'll hear it in the lyrics of those songs, how overwhelmed we were a generation ago, three generations ago. Uh, it was interesting, I was doing that this week just listening to some music and just hear, oh yeah, there it is. 
It's an interesting little experiment to do. And then let's go further and further back. The people have been dealing with, oh my goodness, the circumstances of my life or our collective life are overwhelming to us. That's been from the beginning. Psalm 77 is a great example of this where just a simple line like verse 2, my soul refuses to be comforted. Or this line, you, this is a crying out to God, you keep my eyelids from closing. It's interesting, I had a terrible sleep last night, so I like relate to this. And, and says, I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. Have we ever felt that way? Um, and then we get verse 6, and we think the psalm's going to get better. It does get a little better, actually, as we went on. It got better towards the end. But we think in verse 6 it's going to be better because we hear, I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. It actually sounds like it might be quite lovely, except um, this is the communing that's happening in the night, and the meditation where they're searching their spirit is, is the next verse, where it says, Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love ceased forever? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Like, things are bad. That's the meditation. It, it's not a lovely communing in the night. Oh, isn't this nice? It's like awful in the night, crying out, God's forgotten about us. This is terrible. Like that's what Psalm, that's the heart of Psalm 77. It's interesting to me that we don't read these texts a lot in church or some of us might not read them in our personal life too much. Um, But the Psalms and a lot of the Bible have no problem facing our emotion head on. Uh, It's just all over the place. The the Bible will just have, has no problem just Blaming God for all kinds of things. Like the the Bible is the best at doing that, actually. Um, So this psalm is just, well, has God forgotten to be gracious? This is awful. The Bible just faces it head on. So what can our approach be? What can our approach be in light of these ancient texts? We We can frustrate ourselves trying to eliminate all the conditions that we think lead to being overwhelmed, right? We can... We can, uh, you know, we can ask why as if we are diagnosing a problem in order to figure out the easy solution. Or we can ask why as a crying out to, to one we hope will be with us in it and will perhaps transform it, will overcome it, and will not let all that overwhelms us be the final word. We cry out why, and we also find that God is first and foremost, gentle with us in the state that we are in. God is first and foremost gentle with us in the state that we are in. And we see this actually in the the story we heard, the story about Elijah. Uh, Elijah had really big problems. Elijah was actually standing up to power. He was fighting a kind of revolution against an evil regime of uh, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. We might have heard that name before. Um, that's, this is where, where that name is from. An evil regime of uh, Ahab and Jezebel. And he's actually had a really big victory where God uh, came through in what was kind of like a showdown of the prophets, Elijah against the prophets of Baal. And uh, needless to say, Elijah's victory ended up pushing things over the edge for the king and queen, the evil king and queen. And they decide, enough is enough, we're going to have Elijah killed. And so he runs away. And that's this story that we get. And I want to think about his story through the lens of being overwhelmed. Because try and tell me that Elijah was not overwhelmed in the situation that he was in. Um, and maybe we'll see some wisdom along the way. There's actually two parts to this story, if you, if you heard these two parts. Um, so the first one starts like this. Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under, under a solitary broom tree. And he asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life away. For I am no better than my ancestors. I mean, Elijah's ready. He just wants it all to be over. He 
He wants his life to be done. And then we read, he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. And suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. And he looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. <laughs> right? And the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. Uh, that could be the whole sermon right there, actually, that phrase, Right? I don't know if you heard it that way. I was just sitting there and I kind of heard it that way and thought, oh, that, maybe that's all you need to hear today. Have something to eat and drink or the journey will be too much for you. There's a journey. So have a bit to eat, have some water, right? He, get up, he got up, ate, drank, and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So let's follow through what actually happens for Elijah here. Elijah is wanting to die. It has gotten that bad. And the beginning parts of a solution to this are Elijah naps, Elijah eats, and Elijah drinks water. Someone brings him food and drink. Yes, it's an angel that brings him food and drink. But it, this is actually what we do for friends who are in need, right? This is what we do for friends in need. Friends who are overwhelmed, friends who are grieving, friends who are having trouble. Can I bring you some tea, perhaps? Right? Like, that's, that's what we do. Can I bring a casserole over? Right? Like, that, this is what happens with Elijah. He's distraught, and the angel brings him something to eat and drink. Brings him some to eat and drink. I also want you to think about what is the level of, the, of expectation, the level of expectation that God puts on Elijah at this point. This is, remember, the chief prophet. This is like all the hopes of God's people are pinned on Elijah at this time. And the ex level of expectation that God puts on Elijah. What does God want Elijah to do? Very little. He lies down. Okay, great. What else does he want him to do? Uh, eat and drink. That's it. And listen to the detail. An angel, we read, an angel touched him. Both times we get that detail that an angel comes and touches Elijah. Touch is powerful. Right? Elijah wants his life to be over and has cried out to God saying, just end me. And the angel comes and touches him and says, here, just eat and drink. Nothing is given by the angel or by God about figuring out what he's going to do about being hunted by the most powerful people in the land. Nothing about what the plan should be or how he's going to go back and how it's all going to be sorted out and what he's supposed to do with his life. Nothing about the news of what's been happening for the last day and a half while he's just been lying down under the broom tree. Nothing about, wow, you're wasting your time here. You need to be going over here and getting to work. None of that. Just eat, drink, rest, and the gentle hand of God. And then a 40-day walk. <laughs> a 40-day walk. And so he walks for 40 days, and then we get part two of the story. Uh, he comes to the mountain, and he spend, goes up on the mountain, and he spends the night in a cave. And uh, we read, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And uh, I want to read to you from the message translation for, for Elijah's response. Um, it says, I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel armies, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. I've been working so hard, says Elijah. 
And actually, there's no results. I'm spinning my wheels. And now they're trying to kill me. And I'm the only one left. I'm alone. So Elijah, when he gives his response, he describes how he feels to God. In this very ancient text, we get this little story about someone trying to be faithful to the calling he feels is in his life, uh, of what he's supposed to do. And yes, his calling is a prophet, but this same situation can be true for any of us in what we do, whether it's our work or whether it's a calling as a parent or a grandparent or as a child or just as a human being, whatever we feel like we're called to do, we can feel like we're in the same situation. We've been working hard, spinning our wheels. Progress is either slow or non-existent. In fact, sometimes it feels like we've been trying to go this way and, and we just get, keep getting pulled back. No, we're getting nowhere. We're going in reverse. We want to give up. We're alone. We can feel this way. And we might say it to a friend or a therapist or just to ourselves in our head or over and over and over again to ourselves in our head. Or we might kind of feel it but not quite identify it. Because we might not have had the benefit of a 40-day walk to think about it, which is where Elijah's at. The thing is, God knows that Elijah's career and life has not actually been a failure. God knows that. But Elijah doesn't feel that way. In fact, Elijah... If we know anything about Elijah, we'll know that he becomes remembered as the prophet um, who, it, who kind of represents all the prophets. If we know the story of Jesus when he goes up on the mountain and he's transfigured, it's Moses and Elijah that appear there to represent like law and prophets. Like He's the prophet. God also knows the truth that Elijah is not actually alone, right? Elijah says, I alone am left. There's only me. I'm all alone. Everything I've done has totally failed. I'm no better than my ancestors. God knows that actually none of that is true, right? He's not actually alone. Um, This whole encounter will end up In the end, God is going to send Elijah to anoint two new kings. And then God, uh, as part of that sending, God promises that there will actually be 7,000 people who are faithful. So, okay, so there's you, Elijah, and and there's 7,000 others. Um, And most importantly, what God does is God identifies a successor for Elijah, someone named Elisha, really easy to confuse them. And so what Elijah's going to do, and and the very next story that comes up in 1 Kings, is Elijah is going to uh, select his student who is going to succeed him, so he's going to mentor him. You're not alone. You're about to get, you're about to pass on all of your wisdom. But it's interesting that God doesn't simply challenge Elijah with the reality, with the truth, right? Like God does, just doesn't say to Elijah, oh, stop feeling that way. That's not true. You're not a failure. You've got people. There's, you're going to go and find that, that uh, person you're going to mentor. God doesn't do that. There's a whole other thing that God does. God goes far deeper with Elijah And I would argue God wants to go far deeper with us. I want to read from the Revised Standard Version. We usually read from the New Revised Standard Version, but I love the way the old one phrases this section. So God then says to Elijah, Elijah said, this is how I feel. I'm alone. I've been working my heart out, and nothing's worked, and they're trying to kill me, and I'm all by myself. And then we read this. And God said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind 
rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. What's it all about? What, what, is, what is this life all about? Where is meaning? Where is God to be found in it all? In the big things? Wind, earthquake, fire? Well, God actually has been found in all of these before. Uh, the burning bush may be the most famous of the ones that would fit in the fire category. Or might these things be seen as symbols of the turmoil and torrent of the life we face? Where might our center be found? Where might our grounding be? Where is God? In a whirlwind? In a seemingly out of control fire? In the earthquake shaking everything that seems solid to us? When everything feels like whirlwind or fire and earthquake, where can we turn? And we read that what follows is then there was a still, small voice, or as we read in the New Revised Standard Version, the sound of sheer silence. Those are both equally good translations. Elijah hears what follows the torrent of fire and earthquake and wind, and then then this silence, this, this voice. Elijah hears it and goes and stands at the cave entrance. And a voice says, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's the same question. Same question as we had before. And Elijah gives word for word the same answer. I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel armies, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. But didn't God just solve Elijah's problem? Why is he saying the same thing? See, the way Elijah feels does not simply go away, right? We think, oh, good, turn to God, good, like, get rid of my feelings. That would be really helpful. Thank you, God. Like, just get rid of my overwhelm and and I'll be fine. That's not how it works. The, The way he feels does not simply go away. He's still crying out. Encounter with God is not a solution to the problem. It's not as if we can say, well, if you want to feel, if if you don't want to feel overwhelmed anymore, just take it to God, and then God will just take care of it. Yes, take it to God, but but it's not that God just magically waves a wand and there's the solution. You might feel a little better, sure. But actually, it's more that we are grounded in God, right? Elijah has gone from overwhelmed and feeling completely alone to overwhelmed in God's presence. To cared for gently by God who let him sleep and encouraged him to eat some simple food and drink some water, who led him on a journey and whose still and silent voice speaks even after earthquakes and winds and fires. Amen. I'm going to invite Aaron up.